On today's episode of Among the Clouds, I'm talking to Michael Farron from the band Submotile. Formed in 2018 in Ireland with his wife Daniela, Submotile recently released their second full-length album, Sonic Day Codas, on Shore Dive Records. Michael talks about his early exposure to shoegaze, as well as how his wife talked him into creating music again and forming Submotile. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and stay tuned. Hey, Michael, uh, how's it going? Hey, Neil, very well. Thanks a million for the, the opportunity to talk to you. Well, thanks for joining me. Uh, you're one of the first episodes um, that we're doing, so I'm a little uh, green, a little, uh, <laughs> have no idea what I'm doing, so just bear with me here. Um, likewise, Neil, I, I, don't, I don't do this, this kind of stuff often, so if I, <laughs> if I say something stupid or, or inadvertently turn the camera off, don't be, don't be too surprised. <laughs> All right. Well, I promise I'll say even dumber stuff. So, all right. So uh, people might know you from the band Submotile. So right. They, yeah. Good <laughs> pronunciation. With you and your wife, Daniela. You guys started in 2018. Yeah. You've done right. two albums, an EP, four singles, give or take. Yeah. Um, so your newest album, Sonic Day Codas, just came out. What came first, being a musician or discovering shoegaze? Uh, they kind of happen in parallel uh, a long, long time ago. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm kind of I'm going to have to show my age here. Um, so I'm I'm nearly 45. So I, I started getting into shoegaze um, music around 91. That's um, me too. Right. You know, a fantastic year. Uh, it, so it much was. <laughs> good, yeah. So much good stuff was released. But I, I had um, there was a couple of kind of gateway uh kind of gateway like i didn't just you know decide one day to start listening to slow dive i, I kind of started listening to a couple of things beforehand uh, the first memory of something sort of noisy that that piqued my curiosity was uh dinosaur juniors freak scene okay so there were there was a, a show in the uk on television called snub tv which a lot mm -hmm. of it has been uploaded to YouTube now, but they played the video for Freak Scene sometime around 1989. And uh, it was one of those videos that just struck a nerve with people. Apparently their mailbox was just inundated with compliments. Uh, and I didn't see it at the time, but I had an elder, I have an older sister, Neve. she's seven years older than me. And she at the time was a student and she had pretty good taste in music. So she recorded this on video. And sometime in 1990, I heard this song. And at the time, I was probably listening to some awful, you know, Guns N' Roses or something stupid like that. But I heard this song, Freak Scene, and uh, it just completely blew me away. Uh, and, and I started trying to get into kind of noisy guitar stuff after that. And uh, my sister had a copy of, of a Sonic Youth record, uh, coincidentally called Sister, um, which opens with the song Schizophrenia, which is probably still one of my absolute favorite songs. And, and I just, I went, I, I got really heavily into Sonic Youth. I tried to get like every record of theirs that I could and, and in parallel with Dinosaur Jr. But I remember the moment I got into Shoegaze was I, I watched a lot of MTV's 120 Minutes mm -hmm. and Slow Dive's Morning Rise was one of the videos. They only played about a minute of it, but I was absolutely instantaneously I, I couldn't understand what I was listening to. Um, I was just completely enraptured by this, like maelstrom of beautiful noise. Uh, right. And like you had Neil Halstead, who was just singing along as if, you know, all this noise that was happening in the background had nothing to do with him. <laughs> it, it just like, it, it just, it absolutely blew my mind. Uh, and I don't even think it was kind of labeled as, as shoegaze at the time, or at least it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't a term that was kind of widely used. Um, but I remember I, I went out and I actually I have it here. I went and I bought this. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the morning rise thing. And uh, at the same time, I, um, I kind of annoyed my parents for Christmas. I, I got a guitar. Yeah, that was, I, I think I was, like 14 or 15 and uh, I remember as well that during the summer I went to see uh, I'm not sure if you can see this properly but this show here 
Yeah. So that was like the summer of 91 with some crowd called Nirvana. I don't know, some obscure, whatever happened. They never went anywhere. Never went anywhere. Uh, so they <laughs> op opened up the show. But, you know, as, as good as Nirvana were, Sonic Youth were like an entirely different. It, they were just, it's, it's a bit of a cheesy word, but it was a transcendent. So at that so, time, yeah, that was their peak as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah, they were phenomenal. Like I still, 30, 30 years later, I can still remember. Uh, like the only reason I, could, I was allowed to go to it, you know, I was basically a kid. It was because my sister brought me to it. Walking out of that concert, is, it's a feeling I've been trying to chase for, for, for 30 years, the experience of that night, that mm -hmm. to just be lost in sound. I mean, it, it's happened on a number of occasions subsequently with Spiritualized, I think, in 1993, and Swans in, in 2010, and Seeger Ross and My Bloody Valentine as well. But it, it's not a feeling that comes, comes along often. But when I walked out of that concert, uh, it was like this is what I want to want to do. That that that's kind of how it started. Um, yeah, like being being a musician, like picking up a guitar and, and learning and trying to and getting into kind of good music kind of happened in parallel. So in 2018, Submotile um, forms. You'd been away from the music scene um, for a while. You'd uh, briefly talked about possibly selling some of your old gear that was in storage. Yeah. So what was the catalyst to make you? interested in it again and start doing music again was there a specific band or multiple bands or was it gear um because let's be honest a lot of new gear had come out um, yeah by that time uh so how did that all transition it, I, it was my wife uh daniela the the other half of submotile so i was in the process of selling my gear i'd actually sold sold some of it already uh, and i was in the process of selling uh, my vox amp it's a vox ac30 amp I took it out of storage and brought it home and Daniela looked at it. And I, you know, Vox AC30 amps are like even nice to look at. But right. she looked at it and she's like, why are you, you know, why, why would you, you know, why are you getting rid of this? Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't really have a good answer. Um, so I remember I plugged in one of my guitars into it. And I hadn't done that in, in maybe, maybe nine years. And it was just a, like a, a Fender Jaguar guitar plugged directly into this amp and it was like jesus i forgot how, how nice this sounds <laughs> you know like like um but i remember it just came floating back to me and, and like she encouraged you know it's, it's like you know that actually sounds really nice you know you should try and try and do something with it and, and from there um bear in mind like uh, technology particularly music technology can move incredibly fast i hadn't looked at this stuff in in nine years and when i started looking back in in 2017 2018 when i started looking at what you could do it just blew my mind the the possibilities mm -hmm. um so i remember i downloaded like reaper uh the 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 doll which i still still use mm -hmm. uh and started kind of making ambient uh just almost like keeping a diary uh just plugging the guitar directly into, into an interface and, and recording and then manipulating the recordings with plugins. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd such a, it, it just reconnected my, something that had been dormant for a long time. I, I think when I stopped making music in 2009, I was kind of, I was doing it for the wrong reasons. I was kind of trying to do it to, because at the time I hated my job and, and I thought, you know, if, if I could make money doing this, it would be a fantastic way of, of you know i had my head in the clouds really uh, so, right. so when i got back into it in in 2018 it was for the right reasons it was for the love of it and uh you know just i went down this this incredible path of like i look back on it with a lot of fondness of just discovering what you could do and i suppose i, I hadn't really i'd become very kind of i just listened to the same crap that i listened to you know when i was 15 and I, I, I had kind of stopped trying to seek out new stuff. And so parallel to kind of looking at, at what you could do with, with music software and stuff, I started lo listening to, to newer bands. And it completely, like, I, I couldn't believe the quality of, like, how good this stuff was. And, and like, right. you know, some of the, the, the stuff that's been played on DKFM that I had never heard of. And, like, I had 
become basically convinced that everything had been shit since like 1995. <laughs> well, you, you know, it kind of has, but <laughs> yeah, in, well, in ways, in ways, yes, in that the kind of inventiveness of, of the early 90s is maybe not as prevalent these days. But, you know, I, I, it's, it's incredible, and it's still something that's ongoing with me on forever. Like now I'm, I've reconnected with the love of both making music and discovering kind of new stuff that I would I never knew existed and like I've my my vinyl and CD collection since 2018 has grown exponentially um but what what had happened like I was starting doing this ambient stuff and then one day I was playing um a, a sequence of chords and Daniela started singing over it mm -hmm. she came up with a counter melody on the spot and and uh I was like oh well, hang on a second this actually this sounds really good. So like D Daniela, um, back in Italy when she was younger, like sang in a choir. Okay. Uh, and, um, you know, she's won like poetry competitions and stuff like that. So as both a singer and a lyricist, um, she's, she's extremely good. So that was the song, um, uh, Signs of Signs of My Melody, which is on our first EP, um, mm -hmm. which I thought came out really well. Um, and we just went, went from there. Um, it's it's it started off uh yeah around around april or may uh 2018 i think and we put out that ep in august and then an album then in april uh, 2019 yeah i i've heard to thank really um it was you know from from that question like why are you selling that amp, amp is really where it came from like we had said technology had moved on so much um yeah. was it fun i'm assuming it was fun you know, discovering new gear and, and like going down that okay. rabbit hole of plugins and, you know, cause I mean, you probably is to me, it seems like you had a pretty fast learning curve, you know, I mean, just looking at what's behind you right now, just to think that it's only been like three years, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean? and you're, and, and, and you had said that you're, uh, you weren't exactly happy with the first recordings or whatever. And I mean, obviously we can all say that yeah. too. I mean, it's constantly in, in evolving. A lot of pedal manufacturers and plug-in manufacturers, they're aware of shoegaze, dream pop, yeah. and they're tailoring their products towards that now. Uh, yes. Whereas, you know, when I started doing this, my first shoegaze band that I formed in late 91, um, we just had some boss and DOD pedals and whatever, you know, there was no yeah. whatever, but now you have so many boutique companies coming out with things um, that is obvious they're aware of, at least if not shoegaze and dream pop, they know of bands like hammock and stuff or, you know, yeah. where it's, it's, it's metal and, and, and huge sounding atmosphere. When, I, when Whimsical reformed in 2015 or so, you know, I had to kind of go and start rebuying and, and stuff, uh, gear. Yeah. So it was kind of fun to discover new stuff. And, and for me, I would buy a bunch of stuff and then discover new stuff. And it's like, okay, I got to get rid of this and upgrade to yeah. this. And so it's kind of been a constant, there's been different stages of professionalism to get where I am now um, since we've reformed. So how, what was your experience with that? Oh, very similar. I, I couldn't, I still can't believe the quality of the stuff that comes out because yeah, when I, when I first started learning the guitar in, in 91, 92, it was like a, a you know, a sh like really crap distortion pedal that, that I think cost about like $10. $10. Uh, I had some kind of a, an analog delay that basically sounded like a swarm of bees. <laughs> and, and like uh, I think I had a wah pedal as well um, and I, I didn't realize um, that there had just been this boutique explosion um, since you know whenever probably 2008 maybe was it it started probably um, yeah. and I just went I couldn't believe I started reading forums uh, because it, it it can be a bit what they call the term I've read before is like option anxiety where there, there's like yeah, so much crazy. stuff yeah, you just you just don't know. But like I I read an awful lot about it, and, and like I kept seeing things like the Strymon Big Sky being mentioned all the time. And then I, I looked at the price, and it was like uh, Jesus, and um, like four hundred dollars a pedal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so I ended up I, I I bought one event. Like everything I buy is generally second hand. So mm -hmm. so I try and and kind of 
you know, just keep not, not you know, I keep an eye on what's been sold on Reverb and stuff and, and, and don't sure. try and pick them up a bit cheaper. Um, but it's it's an ongoing love affair with pedals. I thought I had my board complete uh, after we did our first record. It's like I have literally everything I need. I have like there's about uh, four or five delays and like, you know, there are three reverbs and, and six or seven distortions. You couldn't possibly need any more. As you well know, there's always something else that you need. Um, right. So, I, so. Yeah. It's always, it's always swapping that. I mean, I still have a core yeah. few things, but there's always something, you know, coming yeah. out of place. And every time I'm like, okay, well, this is it. You know what I mean? Like, I don't need anything else. And then six months later, it's like, hmm, I don't even have that yeah. pedal anymore. <laughs> I'll have to show you. I'll, I'll see if I can, if I can show you this. Can you see that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. So like there's there's the kind of main board on on the right uh, with the with the switcher system, mm -hmm. and that's what's generally used on, on on the album. But like Daniela's pedals uh, are the ones on the other side. We kind of swap them in and out, uh, but it, it it never ends. But it's such a like it it's it's the feeling of getting a new pedal, uh, particularly one that just sounds really good, and plugging it in, and it's like oh Jesus, like like if it's a particularly inspiring pedal. You know, you, you can write songs from like pedals, like like the Keeley Loomer is another one that we use an awful lot. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've told people you can pretty much do a whole album with just the Loomer if you really want yeah. to. You know, what I mean, you really could. You know, very so. very true. It, it's been a it's an ongoing uh, kind of source of of pleasure, basically. I'm, I'm I I tend to try and like when we record guitars, I try and not add plugins to the record it's you know so i try and get it kind of right that was my question so yeah um are, are you recording all your pedals into the daw and or is it the opposite because for me i pretty much just record um overdrives and fuzzes and then maybe right. a loomer type a specific sound that a pedal does but all my other stuff is all inside Pro Tools because I right. like to have the options later, but you're saying you do the opposite, which is more of like an, an older technique of recording into, you know, 20 years ago, I was recording into, you know, ADATs and, and recording yeah. and stuff. Yeah. So, okay. So, so on, on the first EP and the first album that we did, it, it was basically because of where we lived, like volume was an issue. What we had to do is there was a construction, there was construction happening outside. And when the guys started using their drills, oh that's God. when I, so you can imagine, you know, it, like that's why, you know, neither Daniela nor I look back on the whole process of, of making that record with particular fondness. But now um, we've been very fortunate that we've, we've moved into a place where we can make an awful lot of noise. Um, so generally the way that it's done is I, I've, I have the Vox AC30 amp, I have a magnetone, but the amps are set up in a different room. Uh, and they're basically at pulverizing volumes because I, I've, I've just found, not as a kind of masochistic thing, but I just find that the louder the amp is recorded, I find that the more happier I am with the mix, that it generally just, I don't know, it, I'm probably kidding myself that it's just, just because it's loud and it sounds bad. <laughs> But, uh, but I found with the, the Sonic Day Coders uh, album, that's how we did it. Uh, I've, I use a condenser, um, an AKG 414, I think it is, and, and a SM57. And I have them, I found, it, I found this online, I think on some forum, that a kind of foolproof way of getting a good guitar sound is to put a condenser and a dynamic at angles to each other in front of the center. And it, it really worked. Generally, I try and get it right at source so that when we're mixing it, I don't really add anything except for maybe a bit of EQ, but mm. that's never, never what happens. And what, what we end up doing a lot of is using parallel, um, parallel buses. So we have the, what we've recorded sent off to another thing with usually with reverse reverb and uh, more often than not, we use the sound toys uh, decapitator plug-in, the saturator plug-in, which gets gets used on pretty much everything. So I never get, rec I'm not good enough at recording, I think, to get something that is recorded so well that I don't have to tweak it afterwards. So are, when you're recording guitars, 
are you recording the song start to finish or are you doing it sections and then cutting and pasting because for me that's what i do you know 20 years ago or whatever it was record the song start to finish but now it's like i record the verse i record the chord, and, it, and it's cut and paste and after it's yeah. all been edited and perfect to get all the delays and stuff for working perfectly and stuff so that's yeah. kind of your thing okay that that that's exactly how I do it, which is why that that's microdose there that, that's loaded up, um, which is the third song I think on our on our um, on our mm -hmm. second uh, album. Um, there's a 196 tracks on that, but it, it's <laughs> not. There's not. It's not like there's 90 guitars at the same time. Right, right, because right it's, I guess it's done section by section. But yeah, th that's how it's done. Like I I would very very rarely. Do a do a, a guitar part from start to finish, and usually, like our, our songs are kind of done. They're they're written. It's not kind of standard verse, chorus, verse. It's more section, section, like intro. You know, ambient bit. You know, and, and so forth. You're not using a traditional pop structure of verse, chorus, verse, chorus. Some sort of middle verse, chorus, end. You're. Is it the song dictating what it is? yeah it's kind of sometimes we do like like the there's a song like like sunflower uh which is a very kind of traditional first chorus verse kind of thing but something like microdose that's more ambient bit uh spacey bit noisy bit vamp bit it, it was written yeah but like microdose it, is still kind of like a verse chorus verse chorus and then the whole second half of the song is like a completely different Thing. Yeah, it, it is. And I was trying to think uh, how it was done. And, and I think one of one, I was basically trying to rip off. I know it doesn't sound anything like this, but one of my favorite songs of all time is like Homer by Smashing Pumpkins mm -hmm. uh, from, from Siamese Dream. And like that song is, I think it's not dissimilar in terms of length. It's about six minutes long. Um, I just love the way uh, the outro, like the last two minutes of that song are like completely different. Yeah, I was going to say um, with Microdose, you know, the first time I heard it, as soon as that ending where it stops and then just the guitar comes in, um, I was like, whoa, this is this kind of came out of left field, but in a good way. Um, yeah. And so whenever I send it to people, I go, just make sure you listen to the last half. Get get don't <laughs> skip. Get through it. Get to the last half, because I think you're going to really um there's a payoff, you know what I mean? Because sometimes people yeah. tend to listen to the first oh. 30 seconds and then like, eh, and then move on or whatever. I'm like, just, yes. just listen to all of it, you know. Thanks. Thanks a million. Like it's it's one of our I, I, I remember when we were mixing it, I think it was one of the last ones that, that we, we mixed. Um I remember thinking this this actually this has come out pretty nice. Um and we were actually thinking of opening the album with it uh, at one stage, but it was actually it was never intended um, as a single because I just thought it was too long. So what it, what had happened is I'd sent a copy to Greg, uh, Greg Wilson mm -hmm. uh, from DKFM, and uh, he, he really liked uh, really liked that song. As somebody who's released a couple releases now in, in the genre, are you trying to um, perfect a certain sound each time? Or are you trying to slowly evolve with each release? Um, what are your feelings on that? It, it, it's a it's a good question um i think one of the well rules is probably the wrong word but what we what we try and do is make sure that each release is better and some better is it's another strange word but like there's no point in doing it if you're just repeating if you're just putting out the same kind of template so what we try and do is make sure that each release that we put out sounds at least sonically and technically is is better than the last one but Hopefully, I, it, I think it really translated on, on our last album because we had such a great time doing it. It was so much fun. We don't make money from this. If we no, wanted to make Jesus. money, we would be in a different genre. So you you have to enjoy what you're doing. And that's Absolutely. one thing I've realized, and Chrissy and I realized both, is the older we've we've gotten, this is just a way to be creative now and enjoy ourselves away from just normal life. Whereas yeah. there was definitely a period there back when we were originally around where it became just like a chore, you know, yeah. like, Oh God, we got to go. But we don't have band practice, you know, back, back then we had band practice like every Wednesday night and we were playing live in Chicago, like every three to six weeks for 
five years, you know? And so yes. writing songs was such a slower process because you're always rehearsing and you're always doing this. So it's like, I didn't even want to write songs because, you yes. know, and I was in two other bands too. So now it's, we release record way more stuff now and i'm excited like i you know yeah. i get up in the morning and it's like i i already want to start programming drums or whatever it's before yeah. you know i'm using easy drummer 2 which is super easy but at the time i would have to program drum machines and stuff and like that was like you know i hated it so yeah. for me it's more exciting and and i get something out of it that back in the day I didn't, you know, now it's a, a release for me. Whereas before it was almost like a chore. Um, yes. There's a lot of parallels, like yeah. uh, a lot of parallels. Like, like that was the reason why I stopped doing it uh, in, in 2009 for very similar reasons. It took like two years to come up with eight songs because every, every week there was band rehearsal. I was 32, I think when, when I kind of stopped doing it, it was like, I never want to do this again because it's just like, it's so unrewarding i'm getting so much joy and, and it's a it's a fantastic thing for a for like a husband and wife to do as well although you know it, it leads to some interesting kind of you know kitchen sink arguments over like you know those vocals need to be they need to be louder <laughs> you know so you know instead of the usual kind of married couple disagreements we talk about like how much you know how loud the bass should be yeah i get lots of angry text messages from chris so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you had mentioned something a little earlier about song length is that yeah. something you can keep in mind when you're writing songs it, it is 100 percent. i think you alluded to this earlier um when we were talking about microdose and you were saying you know if you if you if you'd mentioned it to somebody it's like you told them to kind of stick around mm -hmm. uh, it, it's definitely a problem with people's attention spans these days. And it, it's, you know, there's a constant barrage of noise coming from everywhere. But like things like Spotify, you know, people don't, if they don't like what they hear within the first 30 seconds, I'm skipping yeah. on to the next thing. And, and if you're trying to do like a song that's kind of like cinematic and, and, you know, has different sections to it, it's basically, it's, it's impossible to, you know, you can't just start, like, you can't have a song like that and start rocking within the first three seconds, like, with some mosh riff that's instantly recognizable. Like, you know, you build it up. And, and I know, there's people I, say, if you don't get to the chorus within, like, the first 20 seconds, yeah. it's, it's like, dude, I haven't even started the song. The drums aren't even started <laughs> oh, yet. <yeah. laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, I still have my backwards guitars going on, like, you know, <laughs> at that point. It, it, it's very, very difficult. It, it is something that, that we're conscious of. I'm, I'm with Sonic Day Coders, it was always our dream to, our ultimate goal was to put it out on vinyl. So I think we, we cut two songs from it. We've had to, to do it. that. Yeah. Yeah, Sleep to Dream and Bright Smiles both have a song cut. And I hate it because I have to think about vinyl length. Yes. It's, yeah. it's like I have this constraint and, the, and uh, uh, I hate it, to be honest with you. I can't yeah. stand it. Yeah, it, it, it feels like compromise, right? Like, yeah, you know, when you're writing a song, you, it, it kind of it, it's an, it goes in and it takes a natural path. And you feel mm -hmm. like if you've to chop bits out of it, it's kind of like cutting off a, a limb in a way because you grow so attached to the songs. And I don't even listen to vinyl. So the fact that yeah. I'm, I'm basing all of this around a physical medium that I just don't even care about, but it's what people care about. So it, it is. Yeah, it's, it is. It's frustrating. OK, let me ask you. Um, when you're writing songs, are you ever just grabbing an acoustic and writing a song or are you playing through effects and creating a song that way? It, it's about 70, 70, 30%, I'd say 70 in favor of writing on an acoustic uh, and about 30% uh, of the stuff would come up from just messing around with effects with very, yeah, about 70, 30%. I think microdose came part. Most of that came from, from a, like an effect that I stumbled upon that I liked. But the last um, half sounds like it was probably just... So acoustic. that was a jam. Yeah. Um, it's ha it's so, happy mistakes that happen, right? Yeah. I just know for me, if I'm sitting here at the computer or a board, I just grab my acoustic and I'm messing around yeah. and, and, you know, and then I come up with something I like and it goes from there. Because I, I really love doing this then and, and, you know, it's an ongoing thing. I'm, I'm constantly trying to read and, and like understand how to make things better and... and uh, now I, I've I'm 
Sonic Decoders was the first thing that we did where I kind of was really happy with with how it came out. I wanted to ask you about the the drums. Um, yeah. Because not all of the songs, but a lot of them almost have like a jazz or jungle drum and bass programming type style. Is that yeah. something that you're doing on purpose? Yeah. Is, that, is that something you're programming literally by all by hand? It, it or, takes forever to it do. It sounds like it takes forever. Yeah, it, it takes a, a huge, huge amount of time. I use um, Superior Drummer. I, and basically there's a lot of chopping. I also use some of the stereo files from our 2008 uh, session layered uh, in on top. It really, it, ta- it takes a, an awful long time. But you had mentioned earlier that um, you'd written at one stage with the drum machine and uh, it, it, it's quite, I, I had done the same thing and as difficult and as protracted a process it can be these days, it's, it pales in comparison with what it was like 15 years ago. Yeah, I mean, you're using Superior Drummer, I'm using Easy Drummer 2, which is simplified. And I purposely do that I don't go to superior drummer because I feel like I'm going to have too many options Yeah, and I'm going to have option paralysis. Yeah. And I've pretty much figured out ways, easy drummer two to do everything I want to do. I've learned, uh, what's the word? Uh, like ways around what their limitations, you know what I mean? Yeah. I've learned tricks that I've kind of, I don't want to say I invented them, but I invented them to me um, sure. to do everything I want to be able to do in it. And there's really nothing in Superior Drummer that I know of that would help me. Um, yeah. I've thought about it so many times, but I was like, man, I feel like if I get it, I'm just not going to be able to make a decision. It's going to be too many options. I've built a couple of custom kits in it. Mm-hmm. So uh, some of which are, are kind of jazz brush and mallets, uh, and then some of which are kind of almost like death metal. Uh, drum kits and I have them at various points I have a a way of working now that during the quieter sections or the more mellow songs I use the kind of jazzier stuff and when the distortion kicks in I use the other kit because Mm -hmm. it cuts through I think we're kind of a little bit unusual in in the sense that we turn the drums up quite no yours are it's almost drier than I would think they would be and your toms are louder than I would think they would be but yeah. there's so much going on, whereas I'm always trying to bury, bury mine, not to the point where it sounds like just for a day, but to the point yeah. where I'm almost trying to hide the fact that they're fake, you know, right. and um, it's really hard finding that balance of, yeah, OK, you can still hear the drums, but they're not, you know, I don't want because I mean, they're real samples and stuff and easy drummer and all that stuff, yeah. but I don't use any of their pre program stuff. I program all mine by hand. So like every time you hear anything, it's a mouse click, you know what yeah. I mean? Like every ride hit, every whatever, it's programmed by hand. And when you do that, I don't know if in Superior Drummer, but in Easy Drummer, all the dynamics are gone. So I have to go, so it's pretty much like all the kick drums are on 10, all the snares are on 10. Um, but when you use their pre-programmed stuff, there's all kinds of dynamics and stuff yes. or whatever. But I can never find what I want in their pre-programmed stuff. So I always have to change my or you know program it myself. And then I have to go in there and like micro edit um, to get dynamics on like snare fills and stuff like that. But yeah. still, a normal person might not notice. But you know, you a person like you and I are going to notice. Okay, they're fake drums. <laughs> And, yes. um, but yeah, that's the constant battle of trying to, to hide that they're fake, but, and also you are like, your programming for the most part is like super hyper programmed, like we talk about, whereas I try to program mine 95% of the time as a real drummer would play it because our first yeah. drums had a real drummer. So I don't want it to be something where it's so like, whoa, what the hell happened now? You know? Yeah. Like, I'm always wondering like, how long am I going to do this? It scares me. You know what I mean? Because you feel like like we're both 44 and I feel like, man, am I going to still be trying to do this when I'm 60? I hope I well, am because what else am I going to be doing? Yeah, I've been doing I mean, this since I was 13, 12. You know, I started playing yeah. guitar when I was 11. I've been trying to do bands since I was 13. I don't know anything else. I don't have another creative outlet. I can't, I'm not just going to start playing, I don't know, painting or something. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know yeah. anything else to do, but at the same time, I don't want to be that pathetic guy that's, you know, like 
buy but, my stuff on Bandcamp. I'm, <laughs> I'm you know, retired. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, like some people, uh, you know, when I one of the reasons when I when I kind of stopped doing this at 32 was because I kind of had this stupid shit in my head that like, you know, if you're not getting anywhere with this by the time you're 30, you're like, there's no point. I was, right. you know, I was looking, I, I, I want to go back and punch myself. Yeah, but things were different yeah. then. You had to be signed to a big label. You had well, to be, or at least like a Caroline Records, which was basically Virgin Records or whatever, but yeah. you had to be, yeah. but there was still, there's money behind their bands. Do yeah. you know what I mean? You know, I, I'm of I'm of the opinion now that if it's something that brings you joy and and you love doing it, you know, don't ever stop doing it. So, are there any pieces of gear that you feel are vital to your sound? I know you've talked about a couple pedals and plugins or whatnot. Or yep. do you feel like you could pretty much replace all your gear and still do still sound like you? There's various pedals that are used on everything. Big Sky is used on everything, and I think. If that was taken away from me, uh, I'd probably str struggle to replicate a lot of the sounds that we use on, on other pedals. With, with certain, I don't think we rely too much on pedals apart from the, the big sky, which is used on, on everything. But in terms of distortion, it's kind of, it, you know, you know, the fuzz pedals are kind of, you know, there's not that much difference between some of them really. <laughs> Right. Let's, I, let's face I it. I can't even know. get away with fuzz pedals because the, my style of writing is so, I don't want to say the word intricate, but I'm not just strumming chords, you know what I mean? There's sure. open strings and I'm constantly whatever. So if you put a fuzz on there, it just becomes garbage. So I'm, I have right. to kind of use just an overdrive. Um, I own a bunch of fuzzes in my head. I'm going to use them for stuff. <laughs> but it, yeah. it, it, for whatever reason, my style doesn't adapt itself well to fuzz puddles. So, but, but definitely the Vox AC30, that, that can't, the importance of that can't be discounted. It's, it's, for, for the kind of stuff that we do, it's a fantastic amp mm -hmm. um, because it takes pedals so well uh, and records so well as well. So Sonic Day Codas just came out pretty recently. Um, you said you're working on something new. Um, yeah. How far along are you? Any ideas as far as a release date? What we're trying to do with this one is actually, um, it's going to be a little bit longer. Um, the ultimate goal being, which is probably a pipe dream at this stage, but to, to make a double record. Mm -hmm. um, so we've, we've the first, I have 12 songs I think written um, and I am halfway through in terms of tracking the instruments, but we haven't started any vocals yet. The, the, the goal is, um, to have it finished and, and recorded and mastered by the end of the year. But you're like, you're trying you're trying to get to the end of the year to at least be done with track. Yeah, that, that's I would love to put out uh, another album next year. That's that's the goal. But with this one, we'd really like to put it out uh, on vinyl. So if you had to pick um, one song to show somebody, um, it doesn't have to be your favorite, but probably is your favorite. Um, what shoegaze is? Um, who's never heard it before? And then if you also had to pick a song that's by you, that you've personally done, that's your favorite to show them, um, what would they be and why? Um, so I've talked about this song a few times now, you're probably sick of me, uh, sick of me saying it, but Slow Dog's Morning Rise uh, for me would be the, the, the kind of touchstone. Uh, it, like there's everything in, in that song that, that I love about you guys. Um, the, 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 massive sounding um guitars that are just like a, a sonic blur with kind of an indistinguishable chord progression um but just done in a really musical way um the the beautiful kind of detached uh, singing style like even even the lyrics uh, everything about that song just it, it's it's this perfect song to kind of stick on headphones close your eyes and just drift off um, mm -hmm. That to me kind of typifies what shoegaze is all about. To me, I know shoegaze means different things to different people, but that's what it means to me. Um, you know, and people are still trying to emulate it and kind of uh, still influenced by it is, is a testament to how great a song it is. In terms of submotile songs, I think the one that I, 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 I kind of, if I wanted to explain, um, how we fit into the shoegaze genre um, the most. I would play the song called Anadonia. 
which is the sixth song of Sonic J. Coda's. Um, it's quite a long, drony song, but what we were trying to do on that was to conjure up a kind of a, a close your eyes and listen to it on headphones kind of thing and have a song that sort of, if we got it right, was going to transport you in some kind of way, which again sounds like a little bit of a pretentious thing to say, but that, that's that's what we were trying to do. And I, I think it came out really well. I really, really love Daniela's singing on it. It, it. it came, she did such a good job. She really, really nailed nailed the vocals. It's definitely one that I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of it. Um, I love how it came out, but uh, it, it's probably a, an, an odd choice to put on a playlist given that it's six minutes long and kind of takes a really long time to get anywhere if it does indeed go anywhere. Nonetheless, I'm kind of really happy with, with how it came out. And, and uh, to me, it's probably our most kind of shoegazy, um, shoegazy song. I think we it's the one that we've definitely got right. Thanks, Michael, for uh, taking the time to talk to me and doing this episode of Among the Clouds. Where can people find your music online? Uh, well, my absolute pleasure, Neil. Thank you for, for listening to me. I hope I wasn't, uh, wasn't boring you too much and I hope I didn't ramble on too much. Um, <laughs> our stuff can be found uh, in the, the usual places. We're up on, um, on Spotify and um, all the streaming services. But um, if you want to really support us and help us out, please go to Bandcamp. All right. Thanks. And I will talk to you soon. Thanks a million. Take care. <laughs> I'd like to thank Michael for doing this episode and hopefully you learned something about how he writes and records songs. Till next time. Thanks for watching.